Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, the Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Today, we're going to talk about travel, travel for business, travel for pleasure, and we're going to talk about how you can travel to expensive cities on a budget, and we're going to talk about how you can get free upgrades. So I think you'll really enjoy this interview with Mark Kaler, who is a uh, reporter for About.com's budget travel section. And uh, here we go with the interview. We'll be back with that in just less than 60 seconds. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from jasonhartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Mark Kaler to the show. He is a budget travel expert, and he writes for About.com, a great resource. I'm sure you've heard of that site. I'm sure you've used it many times. And we're going to talk about finding travel deals, whether it be getting airline upgrades, visiting the most expensive cities at a good price and staying within a budget, and all that kind of stuff. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Jason, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great to have you. So, talk to us first, if you would, about some of the most expensive cities and how someone can travel to these cities on a budget? Well, I think that there are a lot of people, and and I would put myself in this category, I just can't afford to go to Europe every year. And some people can't afford to go at all, or at least that's what they think. And there's always some very quote-unquote helpful friend or friend of a friend or relative who's more than ready to share that they spent $7 on a Diet Coke in Paris, or they spent $13 on a fast food meal in Paris. And it's possible to do both of those things. Well, you can can just go to a movie theater and do that also. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, there, there is no doubt that there are very expensive cities, uh, some very large expensive cities, and I don't mean to pick on Paris, uh, right here in this country. Uh, New York, San Francisco can be very expensive. And and what I think happens a lot of times, Jason, is that people will go on the internet and just verify what they've already heard, that Paris is expensive, that, that you can spend $425 a night, let's say, for a fairly standard hotel room. And unfortunately, the sad part for me is that I think a lot of times that's where it ends. People don't go any further. They don't explore any other possibilities for making that trip affordable. They just assume they can't go. So they miss out on seeing the Arc de Triomphe or the Louvre or walking down the Champs-Élysées or seeing Big Ben or Westminster Abbey or Times Square in the United States. And it's it's frustrating to me that I think a lot of times people just don't put in the work. It does take work to save money. And you have to do a little homework. But I think if you do, and if you concentrate on a specific city, you can find uh, that it's really not as expensive, perhaps, as you thought it was. That's a good point. Is the secret really just in planning properly so you don't fall into the expensive tourist traps or the $13 fast food meal and, and stuff like that? What really needs to be done to make sure people can manage to stay within a budget that they've established? Well, I think people tend to look at airfares and hotels first. And obviously, that's expensive stuff. Those are both big ticket items. But for example, let's let's take Paris as an example. If you were to visit my town, I live in a, a city in the southeastern United States, about 60,000 people. The county has about 100,000, so it's not a, a tiny place, but it's not a huge city either. Uh, if you were to come and visit my city for a few days, and you would think it's a fairly inexpensive place, you would have to rent a car because the mass transit system here probably wouldn't take you to all the sites you'd want to see. So you're going to rent a car. It's going to be more expensive because this is a smaller city, and because the 
the volume isn't there, they're going to charge you more for that car rental. You're going to put gas in that car. You may have to do insurance. You, you run the risk of something happening to that car. Parking fees. And, and if you go to Paris, I would highly recommend, unless you're in a business situation that you have to be in a specific point, I would highly recommend not renting a car. You can use the Paris Metro, one of the finest transportation systems in the world, for a very nominal fee. You can get almost anywhere in that city of 9 million people. So your actual transportation cost in a city like Paris would be less than they would in a small city in the United States. That's just one example. You can find hotel rooms in Paris for as about as much or less than you would spend in a, in a mid-sized U.S. city. I used Priceline.com, but other people use various things, uh, hot wires out there as well, or many. But Priceline, uh, with them, I got a room in Paris for about $72 a night. It was a very nice business class room, not fancy, but certainly clean and modern and up-to-date and, and very convenient to where I wanted to go. That's about what you would spend in, in the town I live in here in Tennessee. Sure. Now, now I just night. have to ask you, though, Mark, what season was that? Was that Paris's high season or low season or in between? It was between? in the summertime. So it was a high season, not even a shoulder season, huh? Okay, good. It was probably the the first part of the high season, yeah. It was in June and July, and I took my family. We ended up having to get two rooms because in Europe, hotel rooms tend to be very small. But still, at, at $145, $150, I got two very nice rooms. I could have spent two or three times that amount for one room without doing a little work. You know, it, it's all in the understanding. Uh, if you go to London, even in the summertime, the universities in London many times will rent out their dorm facilities. Very Spartan, very basic, nothing fancy there, but it will cost you much less than renting a, a hotel room for the night, and it might be just as centrally located. Right, and it's nicer than a youth hostel, that's for sure. <laughs> Probably so, yes. So, I mean, there you just have to look at what each city offers. You may not be able to find what I just mentioned in every city or the most expensive cities of the world, but they all have things that you can pay attention to and, and, and maybe take advantage of. And it just involves doing some reading and checking it out. So what are some of the other cities? You said you didn't want to pick on Paris, so let's talk about some other cities that are expensive normally, but can be done inexpensively with the proper technique. Well, again, San Francisco is a city that can be quite expensive, but there are many things there uh, that you can experience that really don't cost a whole lot. It doesn't cost much to walk on on the Golden Gate Bridge. It doesn't cost much to walk through Chinatown. Those are both unique experiences to that city. You won't spend a whole lot of money doing that. I found a room centrally located in San Francisco, I think, for about 80 or $90 a night. Parking there is ridiculous. <laughs> in many large cities, you'll, you'll spend a great deal for parking. But if you find a city parking garage, it may cost half as much. And again, these are things that are unique in every city. But if you, if you do your homework and you find out what it is in that place, you can often find a very good deal, and it can be a much less expensive experience than you might think. How about New York? I was just in uh, Manhattan, and I got a great deal on Hotwire, excellent hotel, about $170 a night base price, 210 with taxes and so forth. In New York, that's a great deal. Yeah, it was a great deal. It was at the Benjamin, and really liked it. I mean, it was beautifully upgraded room uh, with, a, with a separate living room and, and kitchenette area, and just the location was right by the Waldorf, right next door, actually. And a lot of UN diplomats were staying right across the street, so I got to witness all of that firsthand, and it yeah, doesn't you know, have what to be real Manhattan expensive, does it? has that I think is interesting is that there are a lot of apartment buildings from maybe the 1940s or 50s that are being renovated into hotels, and these are not going to be expensive four- or five-star hotels. They're going to be two- or three-stars, and they're going to cost about what you mentioned, 150 to $200 a night. They're not going to be the very top of the line. They may have little quirks like that elevator that's very slow, or maybe it takes you three minutes to get the hot water in the shower, those little quirky kind of things. But they have great charm, and as you mentioned, they're in great neighborhoods, you know, the Upper West Side, or they're over by the UN, and you can walk to, to Broadway, or you can walk to whatever great restaurant district you want to go to or walk to the museums or Central Park. And that's a that's a nice thing that I've found in, in my visits to New York. Some of those mid-range hotels that have a lot of character and they're really fine places to stay. Excellent. Pick another city. Well, uh, London. I was in London. Oh, very uh, expensive. Summer. Yeah, very expensive. London hotel rooms are three or $400 a night very easily. I found a room right near Heathrow Airport. And I'm not kidding you. This was not Priceline or, or Hotwire. This was a straight-out buy of $38 a night. Whoa. Very small room now. If you're really choosy about where you're staying, you might not like it there. But it was not noisy. It was not dirty. 
It was just a very basic room. I think I paid another six or seven dollars to to take the little bus, the shuttle bus from the terminal to that hotel, which you know seven dollars for that little ride is is pretty expensive but even at that, I'm, I'm under $50 a night to stay in London, and I'm near the train where I can go into the center of the city. I basically had a real long overnight layover, like a 16-hour layover. So it was good for me. If I was staying there two or three days, uh-uh, I'd, I'd want a much nicer place. But there are, there are places near the airport in a lot of cities where you can find reasonable hotel rooms. Uh, Chicago comes to mind, near O'Hare. Sometimes you can find some very good rates on some nice hotels out in that area. Just out of curiosity, on the airport hotel issue, I generally don't like staying at airport hotels. However, I did stay, and I believe it was in Chicago, at a beautiful intercontinental hotel and got a great deal there. I think I paid about 120 a night, and I couldn't believe how nice it was. It was just a fantastic hotel. Are airport hotels, are, are they a lot less expensive? I mean, there's a different set of economics there, really, right? Well, I think, it, again, it really depends on the city. There are places where you can find some very nice deals. I think in Chicago, for example, there are a lot of hotels near the airport that cater to business travelers. There will be business conventions out there. They'll never see the center of Chicago. They'll they'll come out to that area around O'Hare. And for that reason, during the off season, maybe during the Christmas season when there aren't as many business travelers, you can get some great deals. In other cities, the airport, uh, you know, it may be far removed from the city. It may not have good mass transit connections, might not be a good choice for you might not be convenient. But I think airport hotels have improved over the years. It used to be they were noisy (laughs) and not the kind of places you wanted to stay. But I think they're getting better, in my opinion. You want to pick another city and then maybe we'll move on to our next topic? Another city. I was in Vienna this summer. Love Vienna. What a Vienna is a, a fairly favorites. compact city. It's about 1.6 million people, so it's not small, but it's the, the things that you want to see are generally within walking distance, or at least a lot of them are. A hotel rooms there, two or $300 a night easily. But I, I was able to get a room, and it was actually a suite for about $70 a night, and within walking distance of everything I wanted to see. And, and food there, I found that there were a lot of people selling food right on the street, you know, like little street uh, kiosk kind of things. Very inexpensive, very good food, fully cooked. I mean, you know, it was it was safe, I believe, because it was things that they were cooking. It wasn't raw. So, you know, I, I didn't have any hesitation about eating from some of the street vendors there. And these are the kind of things, you know, you do that for a meal or two, and you, you have a, a room that's $70 a night. You can afford to go out to a nice dinner one night in Vienna, which we did. And we found a place that was fairly, you know, under $25 a person. Which shirt, you know, that wouldn't qualify as a budget travel meal probably, but it was a splurge. And we were able to do that because several other meals during our time there were taken, you know, relatively inexpensively. So, you know, there's Vienna is another place that uh, you do a lot of walking. You don't pay a lot of big fees to get into things. The architecture is stunning. It was strange, though. We were we were there. It was 97 degrees, which for Vienna That's is surprising. quite warm. Yeah. <laughs> So I I might have needed one of those $7 Cokes at one point. (laughs) There you go. You know what seems to be getting tougher and tougher to accomplish? I mean, it, 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 it seems like it was much easier in the past. And that is getting a free upgrade on an airline. Personally, I love to travel. I hate to fly. Unless you're flying business or first class on a long flight, I just can't stand being crammed in like a sardine. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting too picky about the whole thing, but it... I don't think you are. It does not make me happy. I think it's getting much worse. Yeah, it really is. Today is worse than it was 10, 20 years ago. It's interesting that in the last 50 or 60 years, the only thing that has not increased in speed is jet travel. I mean, with a hub and spoke system now, it's arguably a lot slower than it used to be because it's so efficient and the price is lower, obviously, very low, especially when adjusted for inflation since deregulation. But wow, I mean, there's no pleasure in flying. (laughs) There really isn't. And I get more email about bad air air travel experiences than probably anything else. And of course, baggage fees. People are really up in arms, at least the people who visit budget travel dot about dot com uh, tell me that they are very unhappy with this because it was something you got free a few years ago and if you look at your typical coach experience I don't know if it's if it's any tighter in terms of uh, seating and, and leg room sure feels but you're like paying it. five dollars on some air carriers for a pillow you're paying five dollars for a bag of peanuts I mean that's just it, it's gotten to the point where it's really not a, a very pleasant experience at all and people do ask about the free airline upgrades they do exist I mean, it does happen, but I think that there are a lot of factors that go into that. Frankly, I think that they look for people who are paying full price for their ticket. They're the first ones. 
that are probably going to be in line for that upgrade. And if you're a budget traveler, hopefully you're not, you're not one of price. those people. Well, full price uh, is I outrageous. Think frequent I mean, flyers, people who have millions of frequent flyer miles, obviously they get the choice of those seats many, many times. So a lot of times it's just going to be very difficult and, and people make the mistake of begging a flight attendant or begging someone at the gate, uh, you know, someone, an employee who really has no ability to give them what they want and they just become an irritation. So there's a problem, I think, if, if you go in expecting that you're going to be upgraded. But there are a few things you can do. Airlines typically overbook flights because they can't afford empty seats. So many times they have to bump someone off a flight. Even if you have a valid ticket, they may ask you to take a later flight. And my personal preference is to get a, a, a voucher for a free trip. That's the way I like to do that if it happens to me. And sometimes I'll actually volunteer to be bumped if I've got the time and flexibility in my schedule. But others, if you're really interested in an upgrade to business class or first class, why not go up to the, the people at the uh, terminal and say, hey, is this flight overbooked? It is. If you need somebody to be bumped, I would be willing to be bumped in exchange for a first class seat on the next flight. That can work. It doesn't work every time, but it's it's worth asking about. All they can do is say no. Well, let me ask you about that for a moment, though. See, to me, uh, a first class ticket isn't really of any real value unless you're flying to Europe or something sort of significant. Then it's really valuable. It's really cool. But if you're just flying from LA to Chicago, I mean, what's it going to do for you? So your seat's a little wider for two hours. It's just no big deal. That's the way I, I would agree with that, actually. But there are people, Jason, who who just cannot stand coach. And and if that's your well, feeling, well, I'm one you, of you want to pay yeah. a coach price and sit in business class, this is a way to do it. I, I would tend to agree with you, however, that I would, unless I'm going to Europe or something, and then it becomes much more difficult to get that upgrade, obviously. Right, and and you don't want to be bumped because you've planned your trip, and I mean, that's a significant trip, so the, the flexibility of being bumped isn't like, oh, just wait in the airport an extra two hours where there's lots of flights. Sometimes it is, and, and other times it isn't. I mean, and that's a call you have to make. There are many folks who are retired and can fly, and, and they have the next day, and, and they can do it. Uh, many of us are on tight schedules. There have been times when I, I could not possibly be bumped because I just I had to make a connecting flight or I had an appointment the next day. Other times you have that extra day to play with and you say, hey, I'd love to get a free trip out of this. And I'll ask them, are you overbooked? And a lot of times they'll say, no, we're not. And that's the end of the conversation. I remember the old commercials for Continental Airlines. You get three feet before your two legs, which now you get 18 inches if you're lucky. What are some of the other steps someone can take to increase their chance of an upgrade? Well, you know, again, I, I would caution anyone uh, at the outset of this, that, that there are certain things you can do that will increase your chances, but there's really nothing you can do to guarantee it or to make it likely that you'll get an upgrade. I think people, if you have a choice of airports, for example, avoid the big hubs where you're going to run into all kinds of people who have frequent flyer miles and you know are in the million mile club. You're more likely to, to have to compete with, with those folks in a big airport. If you have a choice of flying out of a smaller airport, try that. Wow. Uh, frequent flyer That's miles, good. too, of course. Now, technically, those aren't free. I mean, they're kind of like money you're spending, but you're not spending cash. And a lot of times you can go to the people at the airport and say, hey, I'd like to use... 20,000 frequent flyer miles and get upgraded. And they will look at that. That's that's a very strong possibility depending on uh, you know the situation. I think checking in a little early usually doesn't hurt and, and using some courtesy, having some manners. If they tell you no, say thank you and, and it's over. You know, Badgering someone, I think you know, some of us are taught to be persistent and, and you know, really ask for what we want. I don't think that works for you in this situation. I would be courteous if they say no, we're, we're not going to be able to do that. You let it go. And then later, if things change, they'll remember that you were the polite one <laughs> you know, that didn't badger them and, and they might be able to, to accommodate you. So I think courtesy helps. It obviously doesn't guarantee anything. There, there's an old kind of a, a I don't know, it, it's sort of a, a myth that if you wear a suit, you'll have a better chance than if you're not if you're dressed up in a t-shirt or something like that. I don't know how much that helps. Maybe if they have to make a quick decision, they would take the person who's better dressed, but I, I don't know that it really factors in. Uh, some people will mention that they're on their second honeymoon or it's their, you know, their wedding anniversary or whatever. In rare cases, that might help because the airline knows it's a special day for you and you're likely to remember them if they treat you well, but it's certainly no guarantee. And I, I think there are just a number of, of 
things you can do to, to maybe improve the odds, but just know that there are things that do not work. There, there are people who just sit down in first class and hope that nobody will notice. I think there was a Seinfeld episode where Elaine Bennis tried that, and it did not work. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's probably not going to work. Those seats are very expensive, and they're watching them. Yeah, what else? Anything else for upgrades? No, I, I think, again, you just have to be very careful not to, to, to have low expectations. Don't expect that it's going to happen for you, but certainly doesn't hurt to ask. You have a better chance, too, if you're traveling by yourself or maybe with one other person. If you've got four or five people in total, they're not going to do it. Yeah, Don't yeah, even no ask. Way. Not even, not even going to happen. We'll be back in just a minute. Now you can get Jason's Creating Wealth in Today's Economy Home Study Course. All the knowledge and education revealed in a nine-hour day of the Creating Wealth Boot Camp created in a home study course for you to dive into at your convenience. For more details, go to jasonhartman.com. I always seem to succeed pretty well in getting upgrades in hotels. Have you done any research into that or written about that? It seems like the hotel is much easier than the airline. Yeah, I had a, a wonderful experience in um, Milan this year. And boy, that sounds pretentious, doesn't it? It does, <laughs> Milan, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I, it was just a kind of a stopover. But yeah. Milan is, is the fashion capital of the world, or at least of Europe. And we walked into our hotel, which I had gotten on Priceline, $95 a night. And we had had, frankly, a very bad flight. It was all kinds of things went wrong. We were two hours late. We were tired. And we were greeted at the desk with, hey, I've got a great news for you. We're going to upgrade you to a deluxe suite. And so we end up in this, it was like a small apartment in this four-star hotel, you know, crown molding and fancy chandelier and all That's this. That's great. And it was amazing. And, and we didn't, we paid $95 plus tax for that room. Wow. <laughs> I've done that myself. And it's a That's great probably time. my best hotel yeah. upgrade story. But, but I think... It, Again, courtesy pays there if you ask about it. Frankly, if you're using Priceline, sometimes you have almost no chance because you've paid a small amount, but you never know. If the room, if the hotel's half empty, they, they might as well put you in a nicer room. They really might as well. It doesn't hurt them the way the airline does. The airline's just a different dynamic. With the hotel, though, I find there's a uh, a nice girl at the front. I just flirt with her a bit, and um, and I can be oh, a hot okay. wire guest, and it works great. And I always seem to get an upgrade in the hotel, so that, that works pretty well. Maybe you should write a story. There you go, yeah. You, you know. can be a guest writer on about.com <laughs> and tell us if you're flirting <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but the, the hotel doesn't seem very tough. Any tips on dining or excursions or anything else related to travel, ground transport, things like that? I don't find it very easy to get upgrades at rental car agencies, I'll tell you that. That doesn't work so well. What I like to do with car rentals, if, if you can, is to, to go ahead and book the lowest that they have. Because a lot of times, especially if you're in a city that's busy, you know they won't have that low-end car, and they will upgrade you almost automatically. In, in, in cities like Cincinnati, for example, I don't know, I haven't done it lately, but uh, I had a lot of luck with that. Because if you book the lowest, you know, the compact car, and it's not there, they have to give you a car. You've reserved a car, and they will give you the one that costs quite a bit more money at no extra charge. And that that is one of the big reasons, Mark, to book in advance, because if you just walk up to the counter and you didn't book, then there's no chance. They're just going to sell you what they have at the price they have at that time. So booking the most economical car in advance, very good tip. I agree with you. But be careful. I mean, if, if you're like me and you're kind of awkward with a manual transmission and you really need an automatic, don't <laughs> don't put yourself in a corner because it could work the other way too, where they don't have any uh, higher grade cars and you're stuck with what you reserved. So, you know, don't put yourself in a box, but I think if you're willing to, obviously you have to be willing to get that lower level car, you know, that could happen. But as long as you're willing to do that, I think it's a good strategy to get an upgrade. And I think those happen all the time. Good point. How about cruises, excursions, day trips, dining, any thoughts or tips there? Just thought I'd ask. Cruise excursions have become a real profit center for these cruise companies. Uh, I know, I, I'm not going to mention the, the line, but a couple of years ago I took a cruise and everything they had was so inflated. I would get off the ship at, at the port of call and, and I would meet these guys that would come to greet us, you know, that, that drove taxis or whatever in the town we were in and make a deal for half the cost of what 
the cruise line was charging. And I would ask them about it, and they would laugh, and they'd say, well, there's some profit built into what the cruise line does. Because, you know, Jason, there are a lot of people who just don't want to mess with that. They don't want to make those arrangements. They're they're afraid to, to talk to people. And, and I find that strange. Why are you traveling if you're afraid to talk to the people who live in the town and make a deal on your own? Unless language is a barrier, but many times with taxi drivers, they're able to speak English if they're meeting a ship where they know there are going to be a lot of English speakers or, or whatever your language may be. So I, I think a lot lot of times you need to be careful because when you book a cruise, almost immediately uh, the line will send you an email or, or some kind of communication that says that you better get on these excursions. They're booking up fast because they want you to spend your money with them at these inflated rates. And many times, not always, but many times you can make a much better deal and sometimes for a little more than half the cost just by arranging your own trip. It's not always true, but it's certainly worth checking into. And, and many times, you know, the only disadvantage to that strategy is that you have to pay cash a lot of right. times. And, and the cruise line will allow you to charge your credit card. And that's a big difference. If you don't like to carry a lot of cash, then that strategy may not work. Any thoughts on getting an upgrade on the actual cruise ship, an upgraded stateroom? I was able to do that this summer, um, and I, again, I didn't even ask for it. But I, I there mean, were these ships are some empty rooms. Yeah, I, I was really I was really blessed there for a couple of days. I had a, a couple of days of upgrade upgrade heaven, I guess. But it happens when they don't have. It's not going to happen probably if you're on a a cruise ship in the Caribbean and it's the week between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, it's not going to happen probably. But if you're on a ship where there are some empty cruise cabins, a lot of times it's to their advantage to move people into, you know, instead of having them all spread out and having to have their their housekeeping folks all over the place, sometimes it's a better advantage for them to have you in one area. And if that's an upgrade, you've got it. Again, it's worth asking. It's worth asking about. Yeah, great point. Great point. Well, these are some great tips on upgrades. I just want to ask you one thing uh, in in wrapping up here. Any quick tips on packing light? You talked at the beginning about people are just so upset about these baggage fees. And I just concluded a month of travel, never checked a bag, although I flew on an airline that allows you to check one without a charge. But it's just so much more convenient not to check a bag. You can just get on and off the plane and you're free. Any tips on packing light? I think it's one of the most important things, Jason, these days, because not just because of the baggage fees, but if you're, you're wanting to hop on the metro in Paris, you don't want to have three bags in tow. You don't want to advertise to the pickpockets and scam artists in any city that you're a tourist. If you have one bag behind you and you look like you know what you're doing, they may leave you alone. So there, there are a lot of advantages beyond just the airline fees and, and your muscles. You know, who wants to drag a real heavy bag around all day? I think most of the packing the mistakes that are made by people, they think, oh, well, I'm going to leave important stuff behind. No, most of the time it's taking too much stuff that you really don't need. There's a thing that, that they call the three pile approach. I did not invent this, but I've read about it and I think it's a good tip. You, you start out by putting three piles on your bed. One is an essential, one is less than essential, and one is optional. And then you eliminate that optional pile entirely and then about half of the less than essential so that you're really cutting it in half what you've got laid out. And that that takes some practice and it takes some nerve. At first, some people will say, well, I just can't do that. But try it. You know, a lot of times it does work. And if you can get into one carry-on bag, your trip is going to be so much better. It's going to be more economical. It's going to be more comfortable. It's just a big advantage. And, you know, you are in a situation many times where if you have to wash out a few things, it's preferable to carrying everything you own with you on this two-week trip. I really think it makes a huge difference in the quality of your travel. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, hey, those are some great trips. Anything you'd like the listeners to know in closing? First of all, where can they find you? Just mention that again. Well, it's budget travel, all one word, dot about Dot com. And if you don't remember that, just go to about.com, the front page, the home page for the service about.com, and type in budget travel, and you'll find the website. We have a blog that I update weekly. There are all kinds of tips that you can find for various things, whether it's traveling to expensive cities or, or how to avoid airline fees. Uh, we go through step-by-step budget tips for different things, different destinations around the world. There are tips by city for, for ways you can save money. Just a lot of 
things. I, I've been doing this now. I'm, I'm just about to celebrate my 11th anniversary. And so that's a lot of content and, and keeping up with it, <laughs> keeping it updated is, is quite a challenge. But about.com is just a great resource. And, and there are some other travel, there's a travel channel there of other sites as well. But uh, visit uh, Budget Travel and, and we'll try to save you some money and get you where you want to go. Good stuff. Well, Mark Taylor, thank you so much for joining us today on the Jet Setter Show. And we appreciate the insider tips here. I learned some new things and I will put them to use on my next trip. Sounds great, Jason. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. Opinions of guests are their own. Jason Hartman is acting as president of Platinum Properties Investor Network exclusively. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.